Okay. We're about 50% there. Once we go live, then we'll share. Okay. okay. We should be live on my public page. See it. Here. So do I click in there and then share it? Yeah, I believe so. I'm so trying to. Yes. Correct. Yes. Okay. Great. Should be live on my public page. Okay, stand by. See it. Here. So do I click in there and then share it? I, yeah, I believe so. I'm trying to do it. Copy. Yes, yes, correct. Let me turn so. off my volume. All right, you can hear me, right? Yes. So there's a link in there when you copy. Yeah, I just shared it to my timeline. Okay, perfect. Share it to my timeline. Tammy, were you able to share it to the event? If not, I can do it right now. All right, I, I can do it. All right, for those of us, for those of you joining us, we will go live here in just a few minutes. We are just uh, some technical issues real quick. I'm gonna share this link to the event page. All right, we've got about 10 viewers on right now, and uh, we'll go ahead and introduce Mr. Brian Schachter. Thank you for joining me. Uh, I'd like to start with a brief introduction, uh, give our viewers a uh, background on who you are, your job title, and the industry that you represent. Great, so uh, Brian Schachter, uh, born and raised here in Tucson. I actually live in Marana now with my wife and two young sons, um, went to Catalina Foothills High School graduated back in 2002, uh, went through the U of A Eller College of Management, graduated in 2007. I was fortunate to meet David Freshwater, who's the founder of Watermark, who, which is the company that I work for now. Uh, started out in a, an operational role and shifted over to finance soon thereafter, but uh, recently was named chief investment officer for the company. Uh, we're based here in Tucson. We have 65 projects across 21 states, about 11,000 beds under management, including developments and redevelopments that we're underway on. Um, since 2000, 2011, uh, the company's closed 44 transactions, about $3.2 billion of deal volume. So it's been busy last eight or nine years. Um, and we also just completed the sale of half the company to a group out of Singapore called Keppel Capital. So they're a new partner of ours that helps us continue to grow both domestically and looking at international opportunities eventually. Well, that's incredible. Well, thank you for having me. And just to give the viewers uh, an update on what I'm doing is I am running for the Arizona State Legislature in District 9. And the geographic location of that runs from about Sabino Canyon all the way west to I-10. And so I'm hosting these weekly meetings with leaders in our community discussing issues and policies pertaining to all of us. And uh, so we'll go ahead and start with our first question is, Brian, how, how did the number of cases, COVID cases here in Southern Arizona compare to the rest of your facilities around the nation? Well, we've been very fortunate locally. Um, uh, to my knowledge, we, we don't have any known cases here uh, in Tucson. Um, you know, we have communities that are located, um, you know, in some pretty hotspot areas like New York City area, um, some parts of Florida. Colorado, Illinois. So, you know, unfortunately we do have cases, but we, we believe we've fared fairly well uh, relative to other you know, companies such as ours with the size and kind of scale that we, that we have across the country. But um, Tucson has been very fortunate that we, um, we do not have any cases at this time. 
That's that, that's extraordinary news. Thank you for sharing that. And in Arizona, what is the city, county, and state governments done to make your job easier? You know, it's it it's a little bit of I would say both. I mean, we've had you know certainly resources that have been beneficial in you know getting um, you know, PPE wherever possible. You know, there have been challenges at times, particularly with uh, gowns, um, but. I would say it's been po fairly positive on that front. You know, testing has been one of the bigger challenges. So, you know, while I say that we have no known cases within our communities here, you know, some of that could be as a result of, you know, not, um, you know, universal testing across our residents and associates. And we, you know, fortunately, we're pretty proactive early on, um, you know, early to mid-March. We had to, uh, you know, prevent non-essential visitors from coming into our communities, really stopping, if uh, slowing, if not stopping all of our sales functions so that we weren't touring, you know, people throughout the building. So uh, things that we had to do pretty aggressively to protect, uh, you know, the most vulnerable, which is the senior population, and then obviously the frontline staff that are, that are caring for these folks. Yeah, how, how have you found that that has been uh, impacted on the families, preventing them from visiting their loved ones? I mean, I'm, I'm sure given what you just shared is, is certainly struggle, uh, a challenge facing, facing everyone. Without question, um, early on. So I remember you know, mid March getting several, you know, Facebook messages or emails or phone calls from people you know, pretty upset about what we were doing. You know, it was pretty early on in the crisis and, you know, not everybody was on board with um, some of the lockdown measures that were being taken, not just with our communities, but everywhere. Uh, because they didn't really believe the extent to which this was going to end up at. Um, now, in hindsight, some folks are obviously appreciative of what we did uh, to protect you know, seniors and the, the associates at these communities. Um, but there was definitely pushback early on, like, how can you do this? I'm, I'm, I'm of course, going to visit my family member every day. And it's like, I, I, I understand what you're trying to get at, but the reality is, you know, these people are very much at risk and we need to take uh, precautionary steps to you know, protect everyone involved. Speaking of precautionary steps, are you actively testing your uh, employees as well as residents? We're doing everything that we can. Again, the availability of testing is, you know, not perfect. So, um, you know, there, there's obviously precautionary measures taken, you know, checking temperatures, um, we have a full task force in place that's headed up by our COO who uh, came from Tucson Medical Center, was a COO there, our director of health strategy, also out of the hospital world. So we had some really, uh, you know, strong people in place to be able to, you know, get out ahead of this. Um, but, you know, without universal testing, we're having to do you know, everything that we can to ensure people are, you know, not coming in, uh, you know, infected. But, you know, it, I, I can't say with with perfect certainty that everybody is, um, you know, uh, everybody is getting tested because that's just not the case at this point. Right. When do you expect to allow visitors to start entering your facilities to visit their loved ones again? Yeah. Any anticipated timeline? <laughs> it's a great question. Um, you know, it's going to be state by state, as I mentioned, across 21 of them. So every, every one of those is very different. Um, you know, New York City is going to be very different than Arizona or California. New York and California are our two biggest states from a number of communities standpoint and those obviously have the, the strictest um, protocols at this point. So, you know, I would say we're monitoring it every day, you know, looking at how infection rates are, you know, uh, you know, tracking and, and trying to make the most informed decisions, you know, in conjunction with local and, and national resources. That's fantastic. Uh, here, for here in Southern Arizona, what have you found to be some of the unique benefits for Southern Arizona uh, as far as doing business? Um, you know, I, I, we've found, are you talking specific to COVID or just in general? Uh, just in general, what unique benefits uh, of doing business here in Southern Arizona? Yeah, I mean, we, we've been very fortunate. The company uh, was founded here in Tucson back in the, the mid to late 80s. You know, so we have you know, 30 plus year history, great relationships. And, you know, we, we went from when I started with the company in 2006, having actually no communities here locally to now, Four projects, three of them are newer developments that have opened in the last couple of years. So $250 million of real estate here locally. So we've gone from having little to no presence to now being 
know, probably one of the bigger employers from a, you know, non Raytheon, non, you know, Davis Monthan or U of A standpoint. So, you know, we, um, you know, we've established a, a large presence and we're really looking, you know, to get more involved in, in a lot of different ways. I'm personally, you know, doing so with Emerging Leaders Council I'm on the Marana Planning and Zoning Commission. So something that really wasn't necessary or desired before because we had very little presence here locally has, has changed dramatically in the last really three, four years. Well, well, I certainly commend you guys. What an incredible economic impact to our region. Uh, thank you very much for choosing Tucson. Uh, curious as to how morale is for your staff and uh, your employees during these challenging times and what are you doing to motivate uh, and encouraging them to show up to work every day? Yeah, I mean, we've had to create, you know, flexible kind of protocols for our staff. I mean, a lot of these people have young children that, you know, finding coverage for them is difficult, but these are, you know, essential staffers um, providing caregiving or you know, licensed nurses or RNs um, and dining services for, you know, people that this is their one source of, uh, you know, meals. So it's challenging, no question about it. I mean, we've had to figure out ways if people aren't comfortable coming in that they have the option to opt out. And if they don't feel safe or, you know, obviously looking at ways to incentivize people with, you know, additional compensation for, you know, really being frontline and, and taking some risks. So, you know, it's, it's an ever evolving process, not just within our company, but within the industry. And we're working very closely with, you know, several of the major industry groups that are, you know, lobbying, you know, local and national governmental bodies to be able to get more support, um, you know, PPP programs for some of the communities that are, you know, small business in nature, you know, they're not tied directly to watermark as a whole. It's really individual communities that are essentially small businesses. So, there's a lot of ways that we've had to try and figure out how we can, you know, support folks at the local level while also providing national resources so that, you know, the, the residents and associates are best protected because that's, that's really priority number one at the sacrifice of kind of short term, you know, financial performance. Right. For those who don't know, uh, PPE stands for personal protective equipment. And aside from PPE, is there any other asks or challenges that you would like to see from the local or state government to help make your job easier? I mean, the testing is probably the biggest thing. Um, you know, PPE, we've found some good resources through our financial partners, which are, you know, large scale private equity firms and REITs, so uh, real estate investment trusts. So we, we've had pretty good luck um, with the exception of gowns, actually. Um, that's one of the areas that's been a, a real challenge. And then you know, it's really the testing um, to ensure that we're, you know, able to make sure that people that are potentially inf infected that are that are not, you know, at the communities and, you know, it can go some of the headline news that you've heard about a nursing home that's been infected and that's spread quickly, you know, probably what's happened is there's a lack of testing. Somebody thinks they're okay. And unfortunately, with a vulnerable population, it can spread pretty quickly in, you know, close quarters in a nursing home setting. Yeah, I, I, I can't even imagine what you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. What would you say the new normal looks like going forward in your business once this pandemic uh, passes? Yeah, I mean, there, there's going to be, you know, obviously changes that are going to have to be made in the dining venues, um, in activities programs, transportation, all the services that we provide to folks to be able to, you know, provide ample distancing and, and ensure people are getting what they're paying for because really the lifestyle is what a lot of people are moving into these communities for, especially on the independent living side. So, you know, several of our projects here locally are have robust amenities like multiple dining venues, you know, outdoor, indoor spaces, fitness, wellness, you know, we, we don't want those things to go unutilized. Um, so we have to figure out how to best protect people while allowing them access to the amenities that they're paying for. Um, and then, you know, dining is certainly going to be a unique one for a period of time. You know, right now we're having to deliver food to people's apartments on a daily basis, multiple times a day. And, and that's the best way we can do it right now. Um, but we're going to continuously monitor that situation and, and hopefully get people back in the dining venues as quickly as is safe uh, and appropriate. Yeah. Uh, got, got a couple more questions here. Just uh, curious that what advice do you have for anyone considering moving into a senior living facility and uh, obviously has, well, real life concerns? 
Yeah. Uh, you know, what I would say is, you know, like anything else, do your research. I mean, obviously, some companies are better equipped for, you know, challenges such as this. You know, Watermark has been around for 30 plus years, has been through, you know, ups and downs within the industry and has, has come out the other side, you know, stronger. And, you know, we were fortunate to hire several key positions out of the hospital world that, you know, we didn't know this pandemic was coming, but it, it, it in hindsight was very fortunate hires because they've really stepped up and, and taken a lead role in the task force. So um, we were lucky from that standpoint, but also, you know, we were in the, the, the position to do that financially and, and really prepare for something that, you know, can't really prepare for quite the way you would want to. Um, you know, there's a lot of smaller operators in our space that do a fantastic job. You know, it's just a challenging situation with something like this that, you know, they may not have the financial wherewithal or the resources to really um, withstand, you know, the economic forces here. Um, so that that's unfortunate. And, you know, some of the headline news that you're hearing about, you know, nursing home outbreaks, some of those are unfortunately the, the ones with less resources behind them. Um, so, you know, it's just one of those things that you have to be very uh, careful about where you, yourself or your loved ones are moving into and, and ensure that you know, the company that's going to be taking care of you is um, it has all the right policies, procedures and resources in place. Um, you know, we, we look at what are we doing to kind of prepare to come out the other side, you know, stronger. And, you know, while we're making changes that are obviously going to come at the sacrifice of, you know, near term economic performance, you know, not, not having people move in very much unless it's a truly needs based decision um, and increase PPE costs, staffing, et cetera, to, to prepare for, or, you know, to help with this situation, you know, that, that is to protect the residents and associates so that, when we do come out the other side, there's still a viable industry. And, you know, we, we believe we're going to be in a position to continue to, to flourish um, once things kind of calm down and, and we can continue to operate as close to normal as, uh, as possible. What, what advice would you give uh, family members of re relatives and of, of your residents who are currently not allowed to see your residents? And what advice do you have for them? Yeah, I mean, the communities are probably in a position to help with setting up Zoom calls just like this, uh, Google Meet or FaceTime. You know, we we've actually in advance of all of this had you know several communities here locally that have kind of an IT specialist that you know helps residents with being able to do you know their email with video calls. You know, again, that wasn't with this in mind specifically, but that's proven to be fortunate because I'm sure a lot of those folks that have gotten trained on that have been able to stay in communication with their family members, you know, not, albeit not the way they want to, um, but, you know, video is better than nothing. And so we're at the community level, those folks are continuing to, to assist residents in, in being able to stay in touch with their family members. But, you know, understanding that not getting to visit people in person is unfortunate given the circumstances, but it's, it's the right thing in order to help protect, you know, the most vulnerable here. So I know here in Arizona, our governor has uh, looked at lifting restrictions. Um, now, I'm sure a lot of business owners, small and large, are looking at liabilities associated and how to protect both their clients and uh, visitors. Um, what What are your concerns regarding those liabilities? And is there anything that you could recommend as far as tort reform to better protect you and other employers? Yeah, that's a tough question to answer. I mean, you obviously everybody wants to get back to normal as quickly as possible, but it has to be in a safe manner. And, you know, even with my kids, you know, the, our school, the, my older son's school is planning to open in early June. And the question is, are we comfortable with that? You know, I, I don't know. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's the same thing in senior housing, obviously, especially given you know the, the older clientele and, and that they're at the most risk so we're gonna we're gonna take a very precautionary approach um you know that being said family members have have told us that they want their their parents to be in our communities because you know they believe they're safer and we believe they're safer being in our communities with the resources that we have to help them continue to you know eat regularly get you know access to different amenities and services than they would be, you know, trying to fend for themselves in their own homes where family members probably can't visit them either. So, you know, that that's really the, the public perception focus that we have is to 
you know, tell the story to everybody that, you know, this is a safe environment for people to be in, even during a challenging situation like this, that we were, you know, prepared as much as you can be and, you know, going to do everything to protect um, residents and associates and, and do so in a cautious and strategic manner. I know we've got multiple mediums of which people are asking questions. One of the questions is in Arizona, media outlets have been seeking the number of COVID, uh, the number of COVID cases in assisted living facilities. Is mm -hmm. that something that you guys actively report to the state and then the state reports that out to media or how do you handle those cases and uh, transparency with your business? Yeah, I, I can't speak to the specifics because I'm not directly involved in the task force. I know there are you know, questions about HIPAA protections and that sort of thing as, re as it relates to, you know, reporting cases. So I, I don't know the exact answer, but I know that's become a, a more uh, often talked about, you know, discussion. It basically, you know, what's happening both on the nursing home side, which has been obviously a bigger challenge, um, assisted living, you know, to a lesser extent, but certainly a concern. Um, and so, you know, we're actively involved in that dialogue with, you know, not just local, but also, um, you know, the national uh, senior housing, um, you know, firms that are really focused on discussions with uh, the, the different forms of government. Well, uh, curious what you would like to be the, to see as the top priorities of the new Arizona legislature next, uh, next session. Uh, hmm. um, great question. I, I don't have a, a definitive answer for that. Um, I, I've, I've lived in Tucson my whole life. I mean, infrastructure has always been <laughs> a challenge. Um, so that, that's an important one just personally for me. But uh, from a business standpoint, you know, I, we, we've dealt with some unique challenges as we've uh, built retirement communities and looked to get licensure. I, I don't think that's really direct enough to what you're, you're focused on, but um, just you know, what my experience has been, some unique challenges on that front and you know, on a personal level, just you know, continued improvement of infrastructure to really help equip local, uh, local area for you know, continued growth in population. Absolutely, I agree with you. Roads in particular here in Southern Arizona are, are in need of much improvement. And Brian- That's can, part of the reason I live in Marana. I, I love the infrastructure out there. And I, and I can tell you, having known you, you said you grew up in Tucson, you know, we are very lucky to have you on. And I can tell you that Watermark is extremely lucky to have you on their Thank side you. advocating. I've asked you some really tough questions today and uh, it appears that we may have another question coming in, but um, you know, Watermark is extremely lucky to have you as an advocate. Thank you. Uh, one of our next questions that came in from one of our viewers is, as you build new facilities, how does Southern Air how does Southern Arizona compare with its uh, regulatory efforts? Um, well, Arizona in general, I would say has been pretty good. Um, you know, we have communities in some of the toughest regulatory environments in the country. So California and New York, as I mentioned, and New York in particular, we have a large project that's wrapping up construction just outside of, uh, well, in New York City, just outside of Manhattan in Brooklyn Heights that uh, is an animal unto itself. So um, I, I don't need to say any more. It's been a unique challenge there. But um, our experience in Arizona has been fairly good. You know, there's been a couple of issues as we've wrapped up construction and getting uh, licensure approvals that have been, you know, at times frustrating. But, you know, it's always the intent is obviously a good one, but uh, the reality of um, looking at it in a real world situation just didn't quite align with what they were uh, what they were doing. So I, I, I don't want to <laughs> over go over the overboard with that, but I, we've had a couple of unique uh, issues with getting buildings uh, licensed and, and open in the last few years. And you know, it's just the nature of, of real estate development. Yeah. And, and this is probably going to be more on a personal level. Uh, what what do you enjoy most about Southern Arizona? Why do you choose to keep your family here? Yep. I know you mentioned that uh, we're both part of the Emerging Leaders Council with the Tucson Metro Chamber and involved in the community. What do you love most about our community and uh, that keeps your family here from going elsewhere like California or wherever? Well, I, I love the cost of living. I love the family environment. You know, Marana, where we moved out to, you know, very um, family friendly. There's parks throughout our neighborhood, you know, outdoor opportunities, being able to go golfing, you know, year round is 
is obviously a positive. All of my direct family and my wife's direct family are here locally. So never really had an intention to leave Tucson and was fortunate to, you know, get this opportunity with Watermark while I was still in school and have grown from within. So, you know, I, I know how fortunate that is and uh, I don't take it for granted and, and try and, you know, give back locally through, you know, participation in the Emerging Leaders Council, you know, Miranda Planning and Zoning Commission. I actually fielded a call uh, from one of our financial partners that's considering a project here locally. And he was asking me yesterday about, um, you know, my opinion of the Tucson economy, the market for uh, young professionals. And, um, you know, I went into my whole spiel about what's been going on over the last five, 10 years with downtown and the university. And he kind of stops me and says, so you're a believer, aren't you? I said, you bet you, <laughs> you bet you I am. And so it was, uh, it was a fun conversation really being able to tout the the positives that we have here locally and you know my involvement to try and help push that forward as much as I can. Well I, I certainly thank you for your time. You've been a wealth of information. What would you tell our viewers today on why they should be supportive of my legislative campaign? I, I've known Brendan for probably 25 years now. Um, you know been a good friend um, and you know we hadn't connected for quite a while and then um, Fortunately, got the opportunity with Emerging Leaders Council. He's been open and honest with me about, you know, his views on local politics, national politics. We've had some great conversations. Um, so, you know, I, I can tell you that he's very upfront and honest, and he's going to do what he thinks is right. And, um, you know, I, I wish him the best of luck through this campaign. Brian, Brian. thank you so much for your time. I, I I'll let you go on with your day. Uh, one second. Uh, we. Yes. So uh, once again, thank you very much. We'll try to do this every week. I know the next week we already have a scheduled guest. It's going to be Tim Medkoff uh, of Farhang and Medkoff uh, attorney for law firm. Uh, he, has, he also serves as the chair of the Tucson Metro Chamber of Commerce. And uh, thank you again, Brian. I appreciate you for having me. You're welcome. Us. Thank you for having me. And uh, please, please, uh, for all of our viewers, you can go check out more at my website at Lions for the number four az.com. That's lions4az.com. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thank you.